defense will look like, but I think uh, it's a good sign that guys got up this morning and uh, are here to, to hear what Nick has to say for us. Um, he was part of our virtual coaches clinic a few years ago for you guys that were a part of that. He had a tremendous and awesome presentation there and uh, offensive zone stuff, so I'm sure today's stuff will be great as well. So uh, Nick's uh, coaching at Wisconsin this year. Uh, he's been uh, head coach at uh, Fargo last year. Uh, had a great season, named USHL Coach of the Year last year. And then prior to that, he was with his alma mater at uh, St. Cloud Coaching. And like I said, he's uh, joined Mike Hastings' staff at Wisconsin this year to, to help down there. So great uh, hockey mind from everything I've seen and everything he shared with us. So we're super lucky to have Nick here to, to share this morning with us. So Nick, thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Yep. Thanks for having me, too. Um, we got in a little bit late last night, but I probably got more sleep than some people in this room, so that's uh, it's already a good start for me. Um, first, just want to thank you guys um, and everyone in the room for what you do as coaches, because uh, growing up in Roseau, I had an opportunity to play for my dad, uh, who's here with us this morning, and uh, fortunate to win a state championship together in 2007. Um, so I, I've, I know what I know what you what the impact you guys have um, on the players in our state. And, and the time that goes into it, the commitment that goes into making them better players, uh, better students, better people. Um, so I wanna thank you guys for that because I've been fortunate to be able to recruit uh, in a lot of different places around the world, around the country. Um, and as a Minnesota guy, I'm still such a firm believer that our model works in Minnesota. And it, it's the best model um, that I'm able to see with community-based hockey. And, uh, a lot of that is uh, what everyone in the room here puts into it. So uh, I want to thank you guys for that. As we get into this, just talking about uh, team offense. And I've been pretty fortunate to work with and for a lot of really good hockey people. So I'm sure like all of us, we, uh, we're good at stealing things. So um, as we progress uh, team offense, focusing on line rush and offensive zone play. And talking about team offense, I think a, a term you know, and verbiage that gets used a lot is wanting to play fast. And, and what is that? And for, for us, it's a, all about being predictable and having predictability with where all five guys are going to be on the ice so that you know where that puck's going next. And it makes, it, makes you able, like we said, to play faster, makes it more difficult on the defending players. And then within that, guys, as we'll, as we'll show, um, let the players be creative within that structure, right? They're the ones that are out there playing and making reads. Um, we can do our best to show them concepts and habits and things like that, but ultimately, they're the ones that are out there um, that gotta go make plays and do it. So allowing them that creativity. Okay, starting with line rush. And something we talk about a lot, and, and it's a mindset, it's a habit, uh, it's an identity piece. We call it attack in the dot. And what that means is off of our rush, and we'll let this play out. As 19 Black grabs this, obviously, this is the ice you always want to try to get to, right offensively. It's the most dangerous ice getting to the middle of the rink, okay? Um, but teams that defend well, they're going to push you to the outside at times, right? And it's that mindset and that mentality that when you are pushed wide, okay, you're out is trying to attack the dot and drive this thing to the far post. Okay, and, and a couple things can happen. You can either score, you can draw a penalty, or at the very least, you're gonna create some chaos around the net. So you see here, we attack the dot, we try to drive it to the far post, and even though we don't get a shot on net, you can see what it's done to the defensive structure, right? Four guys collapse tight and low. Okay, so now when we recover this puck and get one to the net, we've got two black jerseys right on top of the paint. So again, that attack the dot mentality, taking that thing to the far post, allows the offensive success and ability to do some things there. Okay, Tampa here. Again, just that thought of attacking the dot and taking it to the far post. Again, you can see what it does to the defensive structure. Backs are turned, they're out of sorts. Now when you're able to recover this puck, it goes right back to the net and we're staring at that. Okay, now some of the teaching points on this that we'll talk with our forwards about. Okay, when we say attack the dot, it's as soon as we get a half a step on this defender, okay, we're thinking about cutting his hands off.
okay, getting to the inside of the ring, cutting his hands off, and again, our route and our destination is always to that far post. Okay, so you'll see here with Barzell, as soon as he senses that space, he takes it, and really good here, keeping his hands away from his body, he's using that inside knee to protect, but again, he's taking this defender out of the equation by getting through his hands, taking his stick out of play. Okay, and again, like we talked about, he's taking that hard route, he's finishing that off at the back post. One more look at it in slow-mo. Again, as soon as you sense half a step, that mindset, that mentality of getting inside hands, getting to the net. Another look here, again, really good job, using that inside knee, even extending, again, keeping hands away from his body, finishing that play off. And once, you, once you're able to, to create that as a forward group, that mindset, that ability to drive pucks inside, it's gonna open so much more for you up off the rush. Okay, and you'll see it here. Sveshnikov with Carolina. But again, right now, okay, once you've established that attack the dot mindset, it's gonna open more things up. Look at the goalie in this situation. He's gonna honor it. Weak side D, he's gonna honor it. They're thinking they're coming again. They're coming to our net again. But like we talked about, that's gonna open up your next play and your next scoring opportunity. Same thing here. Once you've established that, defensemen are gonna start thinking, oh crap, I can't get beat back to my net. It's gonna create more gap for ourselves, right? Which when there's more gap, now you're allowing players the ability to take inside ice and get to that prime scoring area. So we'll work on this a lot in practice, um, whether it was when I was at St. Cloud, uh, Fargo, Wisconsin now, that ability to get to the net individually and then stop and stay to the, at the net. So here's a progression we've used, and this is a little bit off screen. Um, this will start back at the red line, so player on the red line, kind of on the inside part of the circle, okay, he's gonna have a puck on his stick, attacking player's gonna be on the wall. So just to start, defending player with the puck, is just gonna kick this thing over to your offensive player. Okay, and the defender's not trying to disrupt this play. This is just gonna to be token pressure so our offensive player can have some success and feel what that, what, what that attack looks like. Okay, so you can start at 50%, build it to 75, okay, and build it into line from there. But you see here, pass will get kicked out. And again, this is just token, but we're working again on taking this inside ice, cutting his hands off. You can see we're using the inside knee there to take away his stick, okay? And then we're attacking the net, playing it live from there, okay? Other progression you can use, okay, is once this defending player makes the pass, he'll take a shallow route, okay? And we can work on taking that inside ice, getting back to the middle. So you can switch that up and vary that up. Okay, another way we'll work on it, call this one-on-one -on -one drive. Okay, nets are set up cross ice. And to start with this, you can use some tires just to get these these players a uh, uh, reference point on where to start, okay? And I usually like to have the offensive player start a little bit ahead just so he can have some success early, all right? You give him a little bit of offensive advantage early. But puck carrier will be here, all right? And this is on the whistle or on the stick tap, this is a live one-on-one -on -one drive. And you're telling your puck carrier, okay, you're not giving him an out on this. His route is to the far post, okay? That's what, what, what message you're sending to, to that player. He's gonna drive that thing to the far post. So as you see here, on the whistle, live one-on-one -on -one drive. And you'll see now, again, as we watch this back with our players, we're looking at cutting hands off. We're looking at using that inside leg, that inside knee to protect. And again, finishing these plays off at the far post. Another look at it. Again, great job getting through hands, cutting it off. Now teaching point on this clip. Okay, and why we want to get inside as early as we can. The longer we stay wide and outside on this, it allows the defending player more time to cut you off at that strong side post. Okay, so you can see here, instead of getting to the inside, we stay wide. Okay, it allows that defender time to clip him. Now, on the flip side, really good here. Immediately, his first steps right to the inner part of the rink. Okay, so we can own that ice, own that lane, get through his hands, Keep that puck protected, make a play on net. Okay, we'll progress this into a one-on-one -on -one angle. So puck carrier will be here, okay? Angler will be at the blue line. Usually like to start him in, in, in the dot lane, okay?
Okay, so he has an opportunity to get across an angle. But as you see this one, okay, now you're letting the offensive player dictate how he can be most successful and get this thing to the net. So player in red's angling, offensive player as he comes around, now he can make that decision. So you can see how we built it up, right? We've walked, okay, we've jogged, and now we're running with it. So he can either read and take this to the far post, okay, or he can dive to the middle. You can see here, does a great job, again, protecting that puck, taking the edge. Another look at it, player off the bottom of the screen. Again, cutting hands off, getting inside, playing it out from there. Last look at it. Now the angler takes a little bit of a shallow route. His toes, his momentum start taking him down ice. This is where you're building in the reads with your players and giving them the freedom now, showing them the tools where now they can take this thing to the guts of the ice. Really good job here, getting a great opportunity. Okay, now into the line rush. <clears throat> As we build this in, okay, puck carrier is here and talking about our four-man attack patterns, our four-man spacing, something we've talked a lot about uh, the last couple of years, and, and I think a lot more coaches and teams you see are, are going to this, um, but I think the older school way in the terminology was middle lane drive, right? Middle lane drive. And we've actually gone, you know, like I said, a lot of people have as well, to a dot lane drive, okay? And we'll talk about that more as we go. So you can see our driver here is to the dot lane, okay? Our third player is holding the width of the rink, weak side dot lane right off the heels of this driver, so he's always an option. And then your fourth player, okay, in this case happens to be a defenseman, he's following this thing up with good spacing. Okay, and we use the term half a zone away. So as this puck enters the blue, this fourth player should be at the red. As it gets to the top of the circles, he's at the blue, so he's always properly spaced as that next layer coming through. Okay, and in practice, and, and as we watch some of these clips, um, I would say some of the things I've, I've liked the most is when you have forwards and D, they're interchangeable with these with your rush drills and, and your patterns. Um, because there's a lot of times in a game your D might be lugging the mail up the rink um, and, he, and he's not sure what he's doing in one of those first three spots, right? So having that interchangeability in practice and letting those guys get reps in the different spots I think is really important as you get into it. Okay, talking about our dot lane driver. And again, what he's doing is creating two-on-ones, okay? He's creating two-on-ones and puck support by, by driving to that dot lane, okay? He's creating a two-on-one with this strong side D, put some stress under him, okay? And his route, his aiming point is right off the inside shoulder of that strong side D. In this case, he does a really good job pushing that gap back, great little stick pick, and again, like we just saw, great job taking middle ice, getting a puck to the net. Okay, same thing here. Now, puck carrier pulls up. Okay, but here's where that predictability comes into play. And playing fast and knowing where that puck is potentially going next. Our driver in this case, okay, for Vegas, his, his aiming point is for that dot. Again, dot driver. Okay, so once this player pulls up this puck carrier, okay, if he doesn't like anything, defenseman's got a good gap on him, there's no play to be made back through the middle of the ice, he knows can release this thing to the dot and we can create offense or maintain puck possession. So here really good look at it, plays it off the heels to the dot driver, takes it to the hole. Okay, same thing here, there's your release to the dot, right? Aiming for that dot, finishing routes at the dot, and this is Anders Lee here at Edina. Okay, you can see a stick blade on the far part of the screen, and I think you have it, and you'll probably see it tonight with our guys, we're still into it, but your third player generally at times would like to come to the middle of the rink, right? They like to drift and fall into the middle of the rink. And when you think of it this way, if he gets this puck here, right? Not only is this defenseman already probably in his shot lane, but now this goalie, he has to move from strong side post to middle of the net, right? He only has to cover half the amount of distance versus if we keep our width and stay wide, this goalie has to travel post to post. Right? So it's important that we stay dot wide. Um, and again, this is a reference point. You're going to let your players make plays and read where their space is. I get it. But again, the predictability factor, once this puck gets released to the dot driver, he knows he has dot wide support. So he's able to throw this thing off the pillows, create a rebound. It's in the back of the net. 
Again, one more look at it. Really good job staying wide. Okay, what your driver's gonna do as well, it's gonna put the weak side defenseman in a really tough spot. We talked about being close support options. So once we get to this dot lane, okay, 55 for the Islanders has a decision to make now. Right, he's gonna play that backside two on one. If he overcommits here, he's gonna open up that third guy wide. In this case, if he stays center field, okay, it gives that driver time and space to make that next play over. Okay, same thing here. Sam Henches to Tino Grace, drives to the dot lane. And again, you can see if he drives to the middle of the ice, he's taking himself right into pressure, right? So he drives to the dot lane, allows himself to be a support option, which again, the weak side needs late shifting. We get that thing over, create a great A opportunity. Okay, last piece of this dot drive is, and something we talk about a lot, it's not always the middle player on the rink that's gonna be your driver. Okay, and we, and we challenge our guys a lot. It's the next closest player you're sprinting to support and get to that dot, okay? Um, and we call him the lead dog, okay? And I've stolen that from, from uh, coaches in the past. And it's called the lead dog because it's a mindset to sprint, push people back, and get to support, okay? And a lot of times, this guy doesn't get his cookie, right? He doesn't get his puck touch, he doesn't get his assist, he doesn't get his point, but I think it's important as we show players these things, we celebrate these little plays. We celebrate the little successes and the selfless plays that go into creating more offense and setting things up for our teammates. So you'll see here, again, closest player to the puck, drives to that dot, sprints, closest weak side deep all the way with him, opens up our dot wide play, staring at a great A. Same thing here. Okay, you watch the driver. Okay, he's coming from behind, he's late, but he sprints to that dot. Pulls two checkers with him, opens up that next play, it's in the back of the net. Okay, same thing here. Watch the work and the lead dog mindset to sprint, not just to get to the middle of the ice, but to get to that dot lane. Sprints, pulls that weak side knee all the way over with him, which opens up that dot wide play. And I'll probably use this clip just because I love it for the rest of my coaching career, talking about it's not always the middle guy that's the driver, it's the next closest guy. So watch here. This is Chase Brand, Park Rapids, okay? He's the next closest guy. He's gonna sprint to get to that dot. It's a race to be the driver. It's a race to be the driver. He sprints, he gets to the dot, okay? Our third player fans out off of him. Really good job, creating <coughs> time and space for ourselves. Okay, we talk about that four-man attack. In this case, we've got forward, forward, D, and D. Okay, this happens to be Jack Ashan from Burnsville. Okay, he's gonna be one of the three on the rush. And again, this is where in practice, you can add these things in where D are taking reps as forwards, forwards even taking reps as D, so everyone's comfortable with what's going on. We'll see here, our D joints. He's now the puck carrier. We've got dot drive, we've got dot wide. We're half a zone behind. Ring it off the post. Another good look. Again, our drive, our spacing, there's our four man attack. And because we trust our width, because we trust our drive, it allows these guys to use their creativity. And this is outstanding. And I couldn't do that as a player. So when I show the guys, I always say this is what it should look like. But that wasn't, that wasn't me. Um, last couple clips on the line rush here and, and just a couple pieces. And we talked about this um, as a group. And if you're entering the zone with the puck and you don't have that drive support, you don't have anyone getting to the net, we don't just want to waste shots to the net just to get one there. Okay, because the odds of you recovering it or creating a second scoring chance are very, very low. So in these cases, obviously through our same routes, through our same principles, we're able to use some delay options, some interchange with our defenseman up top. There's Spencer Meyer from Sartell, putting one in the net. Same thing here, no support. And this is, a, this is one that I've liked more and more that we've used it, call it dot to dot. So now instead of delaying, you're just gonna keep skating, use the back of the net. Allow those next waves to come through, come in, Find those late options coming into the zone. Really good play. Um, 
Transitioning now into offensive zone play and, and some things that we talk about with our offensive zone. Number one, uh, your offensive zone doesn't start until you get the puck back. Okay, so I think in practice, whether it's small area games, whether it's drills, it always starts with the puck recovery. So creating some sort of 50-50, some sort of confrontation, where you're not always just starting with it. You gotta work to go earn it and get that thing back so you can play some offense, okay? And as we start looking at this, a lot of these concepts, um, you're gonna see with your power play as well. Those same power play concepts, if you're talking one, three, one looks as we get into it, um, and that movement and that interchangeability, you're gonna see a lot of the same things with your five on five play, okay? And as we go through it, you'll see here again, puck to the net, starts with your puck recovery, okay? So for us, our F1 will be our guy on the puck, our F2 will be holding off that strong side post, and just like your power play, right, with your bumper position, our F3 is always gonna be providing dot support, okay? He's obviously a shot option, he's an option to relieve pressure, just like you see when you have the man advantage. So you can see on this, okay, we use a really good job of releasing to our dot support, we go low to high, we spread it, Tip option back to the net, we're creating second chances. Okay, and we talk about using the back of the net a lot. And why we want to use the back of the net offensively? Creates a ton of confusion, okay? You can see here, eyes are facing the end wall. He's trying to find his sword. He's pointing, right? Creating a lot of confusion by using the back of the net. Opens up puck possession, opens up your next plays, back to the cage, okay? Again, starts with puck recovery. Nashville collects it, you can see right away, F3 dot support, F2 working back to the strong side post, and we can long release this to our F2 if you don't like it, and again, that's our, our out and our avenue to change sides and use the back of the net. Really good job here, we'll call him our anchor. Okay, he anchors down, he holds above the goal line, he gives himself space off the wall and initiates contact, where now he can come out the other side. And again, when you can use the back of the net, puts a ton of stress on the coverage that you're going against. So really good job here, F2, collects it, comes off the other side, quick play to F3 out front, back of the net. <laughs> Same thing here, Paling Brothers, okay, Lakeville, use, use the back of the net, find our F3 coming downhill on top of that play. And if your F3's covered, okay, if your F3's covered, again, we want our cycles to get back here so we can release and change sides, but right now, if this player isn't an, isn't an option, our weak side D can start creeping down to that dot so this player has options as you change, come around the back side of the net. Okay, other piece of it. Talk about dot support, Micah Miller, Grand Rapids, putting yourself in that soft ice where when you get these things, we can rip those off the pass, bang it home to the back of the net. Okay, couple ways we'll work on this with our forwards. Okay, low offense, cycle offense. Okay, this is called shadow box. So shadow box, our two black players are the defenders. Okay, black jerseys. Our two red jerseys are the offensive players. Okay, and we've just got some mini nets. You can use whatever you want here just to give some, guide, some guidelines. Okay, and shadow boxing means our two defending players, you're pressuring and going hard, but you're not trying to disrupt this play. Okay, and it's really just trying to give your puck carrier um, the feel of where that pressure is coming from so he can read his space off of that. So you'll see on this clip, okay, coach will be off screen here at the hash. He's got pucks, okay, same thing's gonna happen here up top. So every puck is gonna get rim released in and we're simulating that F2, grabbing that and changing sides. So as this happens, okay, as this happens and he comes around the back of the net, the first defender, you're pressuring hard between the post and this first object. Okay, he's pressuring hard. As this puck climbs up the wall, your second defender, you're pressuring hard, kind of in that middle ice area between the two nets. Okay, so you're always getting token pressure from one of the defenders. Okay, but as this plays out, watch our F3. He's constantly moving, constantly working to open ice to make himself available and make himself an option. Okay, so F2, again, as he comes, he's protecting, he's moving, he's sensing that, that, uh, that pressure. F3's finding soft ice. Again, emphasizing shooting off the pass. One more look at it here. It'll go a little bit off screen, but again, you'll see we're working on puck protection against that token pressure, feeling where that space is, popping things into F3. Okay, and we'll progress that now. 
This is called Laviolette three on two. Okay, the three red players are on offense. Two black jerseys are on defense. So these players will start right around the inside hash. Your third offensive player will start at net front. Okay, coach will be up here with pucks. Every rep's gonna start, you're just gonna spray the puck one way or the other to a half wall. Okay, that's gonna create again that 50-50 race which starts your offense's zone play. So as soon as that puck is sprayed, this defender's gonna go live. Okay, so we'll spray it to the half wall. On first touch now, we're working on releasing this thing to the back of the net to our F2. Okay, release that to the back of the net. Okay, our defender here. Okay, once, that, once this player touches the puck, he can become live on that. And now you're just letting him play. So you're simulating a 50-50, you're simulating a net release to use the back of the net, and then it's just gonna play out live three on two below the top of the circle. So we'll let this play out. We'll release it behind. Again, F3 is working to spot to support. Again, movement, protecting, cutting back, supporting off the puck. And then we always wanna to talk to our guys about finishing at the net, finishing above the goal line, so you're in a position to stay hungry and bear down on these, okay? One more look at it to the bottom of the screen. Puck will cycle in, watch our F3 support. Now we're letting them work, cut back, support the puck, drive things in, finish plays off, okay? Now, transitioning to high offense, okay? High offense, um, watching Tampa, and we, we actually pulled a lot of um, good offensive zone play from Tampa a few years back when they were going through their runs. Um, but a couple things to talk about, okay? Number one, starts with using the back of the net, okay? Change sides. And now when we're talking about our high offense, here are our guidelines, and everyone's a little bit different on this, but when our forward has the puck, we like our D to stay high and available so we can go low to high, and we say by the goal line, right? The earlier the better, okay? What we don't want to have happen is this forward, you just skate the pressure all the way to your D and then pass that thing off to him, okay? So low to high early if we can, okay? Once this forward goes low to high, he's just gonna follow up the wall and get into some soft ice, all right? And now as this thing comes back to the point, and again, a really good skill that we work on our, with our guys a ton at the college level are just these strong side one-timers, okay? D being able to get these pucks off, shoot it off the pass, shoot it off the indirect low to high before this defensive team is in their structure and before this wing can get out and get, and get some gap on you and get that block, okay? So that's a really good skill to hammer home with some high school players. Um, and then as we talk about our, our net front players, okay, our net front players, we refer to these guys as low tracks and high tracks, okay? And really that's gonna give them um, a little bit of a cue on how to space themselves out at the net. I think sometimes players get to the net so hard that you've got two players stacked right on top of the goalie, right? There's not a lot of spacing, there's not a lot of depth for, for rebounds, for puck recoveries in that situation. So you can see here, your first player, he's gonna be your low tracks, Okay, his number one job is getting a screen on the goalie. Okay, screen first, tip second. Your next player, okay, again, kind of like a power play in your bumper spot, he's gonna work to that high tracks. Okay, and high tracks can work anywhere from dot to dot. He can be a little bit creative with that. But again, it gives you some reference points on how to space and where to space. So you can see here, watch our player, pushes out to the high tracks, gives himself some spacing for the high tip, and it's in the back of the net. Okay, same thing here, low to high, strong side pound before this winger can get in the lane. We've got our high tracks, we've got our low tracks who's off screen, who ends up tipping this puck, and it ends up in the back of the net. Same thing here a few years ago at the Frozen Four. Okay, we go early low to high, early low to high, F1 now would follow and climb, and now watch our tracks, low tracks get into the net, High tracks being available. There's the strong side pound off the pass. We get a high tip and a redirect. Final minute of a game. So those are the habits and concepts, even with your tracks, any shooting drills you do early in practice, any second, third puck that goes low to high to your defenseman, you can talk about your forwards. We just say set the tracks. Set the tracks and they know one forward's at net front, one forward's in that high ice looking for a tip option, okay? Um, now that's early low to high. Now on the flip side, when we start activating our defensemen, our reference point on this will be the hash marks. Okay, so this D, like we talked about, he's staying put for that early low to high. 
Once this forward gets around that hash marks, that's his cue to start moving and do something, right? Don't just stand there, start moving, be available, be an option to go do something. And everyone's reads on this are a little bit different. We'll, we'll tell our defenseman to read off of where the puck carrier is. So in this case, if our puck carrier is able to push into the dots, that means our D has space to come down the wall and vice versa. Okay, so our D's reading off the puck carrier where that space is, but again, we're moving off the hash. Here, our forward's pushed into the dot lane, our D can start coming down the wall, create some confusion, and again, you see the tracks, right? Low tracks, high tracks, we created some confusion with some high movement. Big shot, back of the net. Same thing here, as we climb, there's the space down the wall. Now. This is where we talk about being creative within the structure, okay? We'll, we'll allow our D, once they activate and come down the wall, he can check into this play now, okay? He can essentially become a forward, but now the onus is on your puck carry. He's gotta make a strong decision with this puck, right? He's now switched spots with your defenseman, being interchangeable that way, and now watch our defenseman who came down the wall. He's gonna finish this thing up to the net, clean up the garbage, overtime winner. <laughs> Same thing here, down the wall. This is Brady Zemer, we'll just key in on him. Holy family, okay? Once he checks in down the wall, he ends up at the low tracks, right? He's our anchor, he cleans up a rebound, and it's in the back of the net. So again, once we put these things in place, allowing the guys to be creative and be interchangeable, and I'll get to that at the end on how we work on that. Um, on the flip side, we talked about it. This forward's pushed up the wall. Okay, we'll have our strong side D slide to the middle, and our weak side D, We'll fan out. So now we get into this three high look, and this is where it's gonna start looking a lot like your power play, okay? So that forward who climbed, he's now coming downhill. Our weak side defenseman's coming downhill. And now as we make these plays towards the net, again, just like a power play, we're gonna allow our flanks to come off backside posts, right? You finish your routes downhill so we can outnumber at the net. Okay, you'll see here again, defenseman on the weak side, finishes downhill, finishes at the net, scoops it off the back post. Okay, we use a cycle, we release it to our F2, and we call this a climb and slide. You can see we get into this look right now. But again, the predictability of it, our weak side flank, our weak side defenseman knows, he's up, he's over, I can come down. Right, I can come down just like a power play. Luke Jaycox, World Minnesota. Again, the predictability, him coming down the backside scores a huge goal in the NCAA tournament. Again, starts with a great puck battle, the climb, the slide, and again, this weak side flank coming downhill, finishing these plays off. So again, that's a little bit of the structure of the teaching. Um, but I think the, the fun part for me last year getting to be a head coach in Fargo was um, how you get to practice these things, how you get to implement these things. And for us, I can tell you, 90% of our practices uh, we would take the first 10 or 15 minutes and we wouldn't have any goalies. It was all competitive, uh, puck support, puck possession games where we were keeping score on everything. Okay, and I'll walk through a few of them with you. And what I found going through this last year is that this bleeds into a lot of your game. It bleeds into a lot of your offensive zone play. It bleeds into a lot of your breakouts. It bleeds into a ton of how you support and possess the puck. Um, so anytime we're doing these type of drills, our goalies will just be down in the other end doing some movement, uh, doing some tracking, getting what they need to get into practice. So once we finish these puck support, we can just jump right in and get our work going. Okay, so this one's called gates. Um, I'm sure a lot of us have done this before. You've got three gates set up with the tires. Okay, how this works, three on three, you get a point for completing a pass through a gate. Okay, so I'll let this play out. So I think Blue's gonna come up with this. But again, what it's teaching guys off the puck to do is sprint to spots where you can support it and get it back. Okay, puck carriers, you're protecting, you're possessing, you're cutting back, you're buying time and space for your support to come in and help you. On the whistle, six new ones are gonna go in. Okay, this will play out. And again, what we run into issues with this drill guy early is everyone wants to crowd and go to the puck, all six guys, right? They chase it, but once you gain possession, spread out, right? Sprint to open ice, sprint to support. 
Really good job here. Watch the support by White. That'd be a point. Getting through the tire. Getting through the tire. Really good puck support. Puck possession, again, constantly moving, constantly touching, constantly protecting. Okay, this is called uh, chunk three on two. Okay, we're gonna use an ice marker and draw a line down through the middle. And it's as simple as it sounds. We've got three white on this side, okay, versus two blue defenders. And on the flip side, you've got three blue versus two white defenders. So the two defenders are just trying to get it over to their offensive players and vice versa. Okay, and how the scoring works on this, the team that possesses, the color that possesses the puck longer, you're gonna get the point on this rep. Okay, so it's just three on two in a tight area. Okay, and it's all puck support, puck possession, puck movement. Okay, so again, constantly moving off of the puck to support it. With it, you're using your feet, you're generating and opening up passing lanes. Again, defensive players, you're trying to heat it up, get it over to your side. And again, working to get it back, again, putting them in a tight space where they have to make constant plays under pressure, constant decisions under pressure. Okay, next one. This is called, uh, I don't know why they're named what they are. If anyone's <laughs> gonna ask me, I have no clue. So I'm just stealing like a lot of the stuff I do. Uh, this is called Burmy four on three. This is now below the tops of the circle. So this is four on three. We've got four white versus three blue defenders, okay? So the scoring on this, you're counting consecutive passes made. So right now the four whites would be on offense, three blues would be on defense. So you spot a puck, now again, the four whites, that'd be two passes in a row, okay? And you're just keeping score as a coach, okay? You're counting it out loud. If the defending team gets it, offensive team go work to get it back, okay? The defenders, you're just trying to protect it, disrupt, okay? And again, now you're, you're spreading the zone out a little bit more to give them a little more time and space to make plays on this. So this would be four on three. But again, you can see the support off the puck, the movement off the puck, promoting a lot of creativity, a ton of puck support. Now, expanding it a little bit even more, call this Lariana five on three. Now you're using the entire zone. Okay, same scoring, counting consecutive passes. And on this one, you can put some stipulations in on it. You can say, okay, only one touches. Um, you, can, you can put some different things, only forehand passes. However you want to work this, um, but you can add and take out things based on what you want to do and what you want to get in with your group. But again, five on three using the zone. This is a one touch uh, variation, okay? So watch blue. And what the one touch does is it makes guys off the puck support and move to get open for it, okay? So you can see the puck movement. That'd be one, that'd be two, that'd be three, four, five. So you're just counting this out and keeping score. And again, you're promoting execution, putting pucks on the tape, getting pucks off your stick quickly, moving to support it, working to support it. Again, if you lose it, get it back. And now the count would just start over again. But again, love these type of games for promoting that early in practice. And if you think about it, if, and this is what I loved last year, if you, if you invest time and put time into things like this with your teams, all the, all the puck touches you're getting throughout the year, every single practice, all the reads that your players are having to make, supporting pucks, working off the puck. I just think it promotes a ton of growth with and without it. Okay, last game here. Um, this will be players lined up top of the circles, okay, spread out across the entire length of the ring. And this is just gonna be four on four. Coach will be here with a pile of pucks. Okay, this is four on four. Um, and you'll see how this plays out. So team that gets possession of the puck, happens to be white in this case, okay? Immediately, they have to have a player get and fill the middle of the rink inside that center circle, okay? So players off the puck have to work towards the guts of the ice to support it. Again, a lot like your offensive zone, a lot like your power play, okay? Four defending players, in this case, blue, okay? They just can't defend inside this center circle. They've gotta stay outside the center circle. They can't just go stand and get married to that guy in the middle, okay? So you'll see how it plays out. So to get a point, you've got to kick this thing into your middleman, and then he's got to distribute it back out. Okay, that would be considered a point. So what you're going to see on this, right? They kick it in. Guys off the puck now have to work the support and get it back. Okay? Now, what you can do on this, again, kick it in. Guys off the puck have to work, have to move, get this thing back out. What you can do on this as well, once guys get the hang of it, and trust me, this thing might be really sloppy early. I did this with our guys at St. Cloud. And I think Coach Larson 
almost wanted to punt me out of the rink after that one because it went so poorly. Um, but once this guy kicks it out, he can move, and a new player just has to replace him, if that makes sense. You're always kind of moving, supporting off the puck that way. Um, but again, want to obviously thank you guys uh, for what you do in our state. Um, love the players that are coming out of it. I'm sure you, everyone in here just saw the stats of uh, amount of players playing Division One hockey that are coming out of Minnesota. Uh, big credit to the people in this room for what we do. Uh, questions on anything? Yes? Where do you pull the game ideas from? Say that again? Where do you pull the game ideas from? You know what? Um, no, but I could probably get those to Aaron. Yep, I could probably get those and he could get those in your hands. Um, so these ones that, that I got, this is um, the, the ADM, American Development Model, um, and these are all clips from their National Development Program. Um, so just getting to know and work with some of the, the staffs out there. Um, that's where I, I guess last year as a head coach, was able to um, implement some of these things and really learned that I really liked them. Like, really liked them. And um, I would do it all day long with, with my teams. And again, I probably 90% of our practices, it was the first 10, 12, 15 minutes, it was all puck support, puck possession, uh, creating that competitive environment early and getting those drills. Okay. Yep. <coughs> yes? Absolutely, I think so. Like especially the, um, I think some of the, like this last one I showed might be a little bit complex, right? So you can play around with it or maybe even change some things within that. Um, but I think even that first one, that chunk three on two, um, that's about as is as perfect as it can get, even for the younger levels. Um, you've got three on two one side, three on two on the other side, and again, just promoting a ton of puck touches, a ton of support off the puck. I think those are drills. Um, for the most part, that yes, I think you'll be able to do with, with the younger groups. Yeah? You guys are focused on keeping that third dot and that wide dot. Does yeah. that subconsciously create a situation where your team has to join the rush and have you found that that has kind of empowered or pushed your team to do that more in a good way, bad way? What's been the experience with Because, you know, the old guy was the trail guy, and so now you yep. need to compensate for that. Have you found that to be a priority for the team? Yes, absolutely. And I kind of, now that you asked that question, I took a clip out this morning that I was going to show us doing a really poor job of that, where we had our, our third guy drift to the middle right in the same line with our D, and we turned a four on two into a nothing chance. Um, so absolutely, I think when you keep that with um, and, and those situations where now he knows if I don't get that puck off the driver's heels, right, I'm just going to continue driving to the far post and continue pushing that coverage back which then is gonna create that space for your next layer coming up, uh, up the rink. Um, so yeah, really good point, because I think that's something where you promote that and you push your D, constantly get up. I can tell you Coach Hastings, um, I've probably heard him yell it 80 times already this year, just at, at our D, get up, skate, get up, join, and he's constantly pushing them um, to be a part of that. But yeah, that spacing will, will open that up. Nick, what about, uh, Bringing four, when does that alarm bell go off for that D that it's no longer a rush? And now, because you don't want three on ones, two on ones come back. And when, especially our kids, you know, they're not great at hitting that all the time. Like yeah. Bring them out of the zone or whatever. Yeah. As much as we love it, how much you don't want to give up to a one the other way? When is there a stopping point anywhere? Is that just a feel for the player? Yeah. Well, you didn't see our game last night because we, we had a couple D getting up a little bit too aggressive on that, but um, we'll use the term uh, or the terminology check in and check out. So that's whether it's off the rush um, or whether it's in the offensive zone. So as our D are joining there, um, that's just a little bit of a mental cue of, okay, I'm gonna check into this play and sniff it and see if anything materializes. Um, and then I'm gonna check out. I think that feel, um, not to get around your question, but I. Do you think, at least in my mind, that's going to be a field thing? I don't know that I've ever had a set rule on that. Um, some guys are going to be better skaters than others. Uh, Jack Ashan, right? He's going to get as far down as he can on that play because he knows he can recover, right? Um, where some other guys might just have to trail out a little bit early. But I think it's just showing that and teaching that. Um, and then you can't miss an net on that either, right? 
say that a couple times last night too. So I can't pull it off. Okay, what's the conversation last night on the bench or in the locker room when you guys were putting 61 rips on net and Aaron Hawk and like what were the messaging to the players? Stay with it. The guys are frustrated, right? Like stay with it. And I think that's for us as a new staff with a new group. I think that's something um, we're excited to see what we have in that department, sure. right? And that that trust that resiliency that stick with it um, and going we talked about that a lot all week going into last night obviously going into the night as well um, there's going to be things that don't go your way um, goaltending officiating uh, goals called off different things we saw last night that could have derailed a younger team right um, could have sent us off the tracks a little bit um, so that was the message but Glad you brought that up because I think that's, and even at the high school level, that's really important. Um, because for us, I think that's something that we're still learning about our group, how we handle that. Um, we'll we'll see what we got tonight in that department too, because we'll we'll face some stuff as well. Hey, you talked a little bit about like your three high offensive solid and your ability for your defenseman or whoever it is on the plane to drop. All the clips you showed, you scored, so there's no. One more up and show you on this as well. Part of my question too is is it still about the defenseman checking in or checking out, or is it hair on fire, everybody get back? What's the communication? What, what's the mindset? And then also hoping that you create a turnover to truly turn it right back around and go again. Yes, absolutely. Um, so when we talk about those guys being interchangeable in the offensive zone, and I, I think I talked about it in this clip as well. Like, this is a little bit different, right? But <clears throat> now in this case, this is going to be a little bit better picture than what you're talking about, where we didn't have everyone so pot committed to offense, right? Where now you have a forward essentially at the point acting as a D, um, and this defenseman's going to check in now and take that forward spot, right? Um, so on that piece of it. Now, what you can see, <clears throat> so what we'll talk about on this, right, is if this puck gets to the point and this shot is recovered, the reason we want this guy starting to come downhill is you talk about puck recovery. His responsibility, let me pull my drawer up quick. This weak side flank's responsibility on any shot from this part of the rink is going to be recovery here. So because he's starting to come downhill, so if this puck gets shot and sprayed, right, which obviously he holds it, if it comes here, Okay, there's your recovery, there's your fill, and now he's essentially got to be the one acting back as your defenseman, right? So what that, what those flankers do when they come downhill is they're going to allow that momentum to grab pucks on that half of the ice. Does that answer your question? Yeah, you're essentially just you're gapping up, you're keeping them checked in, and essentially gap interfering. Yes, yes. In the offensive corner versus yep. defensive open stacking up like our guys would be a younger age more happy. Yes, and again, it's, so use this clip as another example. This one just gets funneled to the net, but if this were to spray off on the weak side, he's already coming down on it, he's over the top, he's back covering up high, right? Um, so again, I think it's giving these guys the freedom to sniff that, right? And then I think as a coach, you're gonna have to find what your, what your level of comfort is with that, your threshold is with that. Are we? All or nothing, toes downhill going for it. Are we going to have a little bit more um, hesitation and pullback on that? You know what I mean? But you can see on this, so even if this sprays to the corner, we're first on this puck, right? Because he's coming downhill, he's already underneath this coverage. We're going to be able to get to that first and maintain possession. And like you said, presetting your gaps, keeping things alive on walls, making it tough for people to break out. Yeah, could you still have the guys go in low on 
say late in the third quarter you want to go elite? Or do you have him stay back? Yeah. He, or is that just a pedal thing? No, I've always struggled with that same question, right? Because party as a coach, in your own mind, you know, hey, we got a lead. We, we want to hold this. We want to be a little bit air on the side of defense. Um, but I'm also always find myself cautious on how to message that to guys because you don't just want them just thinking pure defense now, right? You still want them thinking, um, build the lead, get the next goal, defend out of the offensive zone, defend with the puck on our stick, right? Um, so that piece is always um, a little bit, I've always found a challenge for me even uh, going through that last year. Um, but yeah, I would say, you know, those are simple verbal reminders to your D like, hey, we don't need to be getting down to the goal line right now. We don't need to be um, getting over committed offensively right now, keep things in front of you. I, I do think um, there's a way you can message that to them without totally having them just stand on the blue line because I do think a lot of your defense with that can come from, like, like we talked about, presetting your gaps and being, being tight gapped on wingers um, and you're, you're just bottling things up, right? Um, so it is, a, it, is a, it is a gray area a little bit, right? But, um, but no, I think there is definitely you can, you can message that. Hey, Coach, real quick. How would you compare your locker room to UMD's locker room? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we had a tour last night and it's breathtaking. Yeah. It's comfortable for me. There's a sauna in there. <laughs> yeah, there's a sauna. It, you know what? It's cool now, like just with all the Division One programs and, and the resources that, that these players have now, like it's it's amazing. Whether it's here, whether it's at Wisconsin, whether it's so many other places. I was at St. Cloud for for four years. And, What's the coolest locker room you've ever seen? Because this is the coolest one I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never been in this one. But I've been in Notre Dame. I've never been in Vegas. I've never been, you know, like, you, you've been there. Yeah, good question. That's a good question. I don't know if I have an answer off the top of my head. But this one, I've never been in this one. You haven't? No. And I don't think they're going to give me a tour today. <laughs> <laughs> Not wearing this jacket. <laughs> did push-ups um, push-ups or you can do a quick uh, like if you've got them lined up what we've done too on the top of the circles or the blue line it's just a quick down and back you know just a quick skate um, or push-ups anything that way that's kind of quick and intense but I think that's I always like having something on the line like always whether it's something small something bigger um, I think that just adds to it because once you don't do it then the game might mean a little bit less I don't know if that makes sense <coughs> Keep it consistent. Well, awesome job. Thanks for coming. We really appreciate it. Good luck tonight. Thanks, Aaron.